in in absence of any other response, I'm going to start out since it is past five thirty now. Can everyone hear me? Just one from from raise a hand. Oh, perfect. Thank you, Stuart. I appreciate that. Um, so I'm going to share my screen very quickly, and you can let me know with that wonderful thumbs up if that works. Um, and hopefully it will. So let me know if you all can see what I can see. Stuart, awesome. We all recognize who this lovely, lovely human is. Um, great. Well, thank you everyone for being here. I'm going to jump into about a 20 minute talk and then, um, you know, would love to get into conversation and dialogue. Uh, just very quick introduction. Uh, I'm Amit. Um, some of you I know already. Um, live in San Francisco, been here for a long time. And uh, VC, um, I run the Silicon Valley Blockchain Society. We're probably the largest institutional investor network in that intersection of IoT, AI, and blockchain. Um, my background is deep tech. I've been doing um, AI for a long time now. Started a lab about 16 years ago. Um, and we've been focusing on cognitive AI for a while. I personally focus a lot on responsible AI, specifically as it pertains to privacy, uh, decentralizing data models, and then thinking about the future of work, especially in an AI-powered world. That being context, um, you know, many of you know who's up on screen and you know probably think very highly of of what she's trying to do and. And in spite of all of the efforts, in spite of all of the attention, you know, unless you've been living under a rock, the idea that a 16-year-old with Asperger's and an unflinching dedication to alerting, almost demanding that the world pay attention to the climate crisis we've created for our host planet is rather astonishing, isn't it? And think what you may of her mission her tone, her utter irreverence towards my generation and the one before, it was really hard to ignore her and the collective movement that she triggered. Buckminster Fuller would have been proud. We are called to be architects of the future, not its victims, he said. There is an entire generation that we call entitled addicted to their phones and obsessed more by Instagram than basketball. But they're also the most consciously aware and activist than ever before. Um, for all of you here who like very specific numbers, individual activism is up about a gazillion percent, give or take a few. The fastest growing investor sector by volume, not dollar value, but volume, is impact, not AI, not blockchain or crypto, even crypto circa 2017. Remember those days? No, it's impact. And it's really interesting because if you look at the world of impact, investments in ESG-leaning mutual funds and ETFs doubled over the past six months, and they continue to double. 93% of millennials believe that ESG is a key decision maker for, for investment decisions. 66% of high net worth individuals work for our own stock in companies with ESG values built in. The number one retention tool outside of pure wage and role for the next generation is how responsible they perceive the company to be. You know, suddenly that whole do no evil as a mantra isn't worth the napkin it was written on anymore. 
So unless you were indeed living under that rock, Greta had, at the minimum, made us think about our role in this revolution. Are we its victims? Are we its culprits? Are, are we its enablers? And like with life, all of you in this virtual room likely feel a combination of all of those and then some. And yet, so much of existing society, existing powers that be, especially here, for example, in the White House, tried just that, to ignore this collective global movement. America first, after all. Let the Chinese and the Indians deal with their smog-filled cities. Stay the course, business as usual. Boom. COVID-19 showed up, a virus with origins in China and a generic name of a popular Mexican beer shut everything down. Business as usual, America first. As Apple's autocorrect would say, wake the duck up. This is the great reset. Not one driven by market or economic forces. This was Earth, right? Think of it, our landlady saying, enough between the hedonistic parties, the debauchery, the ridiculously loud blaring music, the unruly guests, the destruction to neighbors' property at ungodly hours, the needles and empty cans strewn all over, and incessant complaints from all the neighbors, and some dead bodies along the way. You know, the uh, Weekend at Bernie's Planetary Edition. She had no choice but to give us a final warning. After this, the eviction is coming. We are on approximately a four month notice period, give or take. So here we are sitting, brooding in our isolation in the realization of just how utterly fragile we all are, how fragile this economic system is that we rely on. A much vaunted model of capitalism built for zero resilience. Even a month or two of economic shutdown left capitalism desperately sucking on the teats of much maligned government. On the plus side, in this notice period, we're learning the benefits and power of being effective working online from home. We're starting to enjoy those socially distanced walks, the intentionality of connecting with loved ones far and near on Zoom happy hours, and above all, we're learning that the best defense against illness and pandemics will be enhancing our immunity rather than relying just on vaccines because as critical as they are, they might not be ready for 18 to 24 months after each pandemic hits us. So what does this post notice period look like? Scenario one, we go back to normal. Production goes into overdrive to make up for this lost time. Manufacturing plants run 24 seven to catch up. Employees are offered multiple shifts per day, which they take because they need the money. Tax incentives bring more investors to these industries. Cruise lines, airlines, energy, all of those canceled work trips need to be taken in a shortened time frame. Car dealers drop massive incentives to move all that stacked up inventory. Even though you've enjoyed that time of not having to commute, true for many of us, not having to drive two hours a day and started to cherish those long walks, how can you resist the ridiculous once in a lifetime $15,000, $20,000 discount on that BMW you've always dreamed of owning? We're going to see an alarming surge towards a surveillance state. You know, think Patriot Act post 9 11 part two, but driven by big data and AI and an assault on our privacy in the name of far more effective coordination and anticipation for future spread of pandemics. Contract tracing and tracking are already underway. You know, Apple and Google are licking their data hungry lips. And we hurtled towards more nationalism in our politics and turned to the religious ideologues for answers. Prayer over research. The cycle repeats. 
you get the picture. We go back to normal. There won't be another warning, I'm afraid. It'll be eviction. We'll give you a second to, to read that and it'll feel familiar, but the truth though, this reset gives us the biggest opportunity we've had to come out of this stronger together. The rise of the collective over the individual, families spending more time together, albeit forced in many cases. We've never seen as many offers for free health services online, right? Yoga, meditation, in-home workouts, so on and so forth. And if honestly, I don't know about all of you, but if I can stop eating constantly, the disadvantage of being home and having a fully stocked kitchen, there is a good chance many will come out of this isolation looking and feeling better than we did a few months ago, or at least on the path to doing so. We've also seen a massive drop in production and consumption. Well, except for toilet paper, as it turns out. In New York, as an example, levels of carbon monoxide, which mainly, as you know, come from car exhaust, have dropped nearly 50%. In so many cities, the sky looks clear and beautiful. And especially in cities in China and India, where, where I was born, for the last 10 years, my family hasn't seen the sky or the stars. This is the first time, I mean, it, it's bonkers. And, and interspersed with fake stories of dolphins shopping at downtown malls in Milan and lions doing push-ups in public parks in Moscow, just look around you and you can see the emergence of nature all around us. So what if we did a fundamental rethink of the metrics that we use to measure progress, right? What if we replace the traditional GDP, one that measures the combination of consumption, government spending, investment in infrastructure, and net exports? And we added some of these metrics. What if we added net physical activity, right? So contact tracing and tracking, great. Well, why don't we use that anonymously, zero knowledge proofs, right? And we can, we can actually count the total amount of time that, <laughs> hi to the, to the girls, um, the, 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 the total amount of time that um, an activity and steps that people take. You know, what if we added the amount of time spent at home, at home, amount of time spent in learning activities? So we can track, but let's track for the responsible stuff. Right, So people online learning new languages or learning how to play an instrument or a new dance form, you know, these are amazing things. And we could add those in. We could add in communitas, time spent with, with friends you know, online. This is wonderful. Those Zoom happy hours can have a real positive impact. And then, of course, we could look at our, our overall you know, net negative carbon impact. So two and a half, three percent, four percent targets for GDP growth are fine. Let's just think about it in a slightly more responsible way. And we can do the same thing with, with investors as well, right? So I'm an investor who, who is deeply involved in the world of impact. And I want to introduce you to this idea, if you haven't already heard of, of deep impact. Um, I want investors to not just think about their traditional metrics, right? Smart investors will want to know the true health of companies they invest in. How much net time are employees, partners, vendors of their investments spending on being healthy, mind and body with family and loved ones? And, and we elect leaders who not only believe in science, but champion it. Very quickly on, on deep impact, um, if you take a company like Lockheed Martin, for example, big American bellwether, and the CEO woke up one day in this great reset and the CEO said, I have an all male, all white board. 
this is terrible, not just from an equality perspective, but from a diversity perspective. This is not good for the company. And five white men resigned and women came on, incredible women, added phenomenal value. And the same thing happened in the management team. And they looked at their supply chain in Wuhan and said, this is unacceptable. And they changed that. They, they introduced policies in China that were the policies for the employees in Chicago. And they learned from all of these online meetings that we can reduce travel by 86%. We would all look at that and say, wow, that's some impact. And yet, their core business is to make weapons of war. The systemic challenges that Earth faces in her eviction notice of us, or upcoming eviction notice, is driven by some of these sy systemic challenges. And so deep impact can, gets into the idea that we not only consider the intended consequences of what we build individually or as companies or as communities, but the unintended consequences. And we have an ongoing transparent governance model that allows us to cater to this. And then there's been this interesting conversation around UBI that has come up because of, of or certainly accelerated because of uh, Corona. Andrew Yang, for those of you who have the context, who's running for president, was advocating $1,000 a month of UBI. And there's a lot of challenges um, on, on who you tax, how you make it work. But one of the biggest challenges around that, and this is a completely apolitical slide. Does anyone remember from 2016 what Hillary Clinton's core message was in a single hashtag? It's a trick question, no one remembers. It was something like this, right? Trump is crazy, democracy is hard, but if we come together, you know, we can save Obamacare and we can protect the dreamers. Um, all true, but what the hell in you know, one second messaging? And when you ask everyone, what was Trump's message? Boom, make America great again. What the hell did that even mean, right? If you were a white supremacist, it meant make America white again. If you were anti-immigration, it meant build a wall. If you were anti-trade, it meant kill NAFTA. Narrative is really important, but it needs to be you know, like, both. Like I've had the experience recently where I go to my doctor and I, I tell them something that's wrong. I'm Okay, good. That wasn't for me. I was like, Nick has something to say, but he wasn't on mute. So narrative needs to be both inclusive and incisive. So as we come out of the Great Reset, the things we work on and discuss need to be as relevant for Silicon Valley or Munich or Monaco, but also for my 70-year-old mom in India the farmer in Rwanda, the laborer in Bangladesh, and the Trump supporter in Kansas. So let me give you an example then of this issue with universal basic income. UBI, great as it might be, sounds like it is free, it is welfare, it is possibly even undeserved to the average capitalist. A couple of years ago, I introduced the term the universal earned income. Earned is a term that most people like, capitalists can get behind. And the earning actually comes from the world that we're living in, this online world, from monetizing securely on the blockchain, we can use anonymity with consent of the user, nearly three trillion in value that is hiding in plain sight in our digital exos. So, I've been advocating for this for a, for a long time, and I you know, actually uh, spearheaded a project and an amazing team working on it called Rainfall. Uh, Rainfall.1 is the URL. But the whole idea was how do we use contextualized AI to create the same kind of value around individual data that what I call GAFABAT, Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent do, um, and from that value, create intelligence and insights that can be made available to businesses. And the income that flows through from that, all automated, friction-free on the blockchain, goes back to all of the creators. So people around the world 
have that ability to make an income and eventually get to a point where that income meets their basic needs. Uh, we see that as being six dollars a day in income for the next billion people, you know, people in India, Africa, South America. And then, of course, we see this, the people on the margins around the world. And it's things like that in the idea of the great, great reset, where we take away that fr the fragility of our economic systems, where if I don't have income for the next four days, I can't feed my family is a terrible way for us to be living as an overall society. And we can use the advances in AI, we can use the advances in blockchain so that we don't have to suck on the teats of government when we think about solutions. So until we find a way to, to you know, capture that messaging void like Trump did, unlike Hillary, with a more appealing, inclusive narrative, we tend to lose before we get to even make our case. So let me make the case that the metaphor that this great reset represents is not just save us from, from eviction, but it is our biggest financial opportunity that we've had. And the opportunity really abounds. I mean, you think about it in green energy storage, you think about it in the future of health, the future of wealth, the future of work, even in the, in the realms of impact, when you can combine broad and deep impact with, with helping even the most vulnerable in society. I sit on the board of this incredible, one of the finest, largest refugee agencies in the world called the Norwegian Refugee Council. And for these kids in, in Congo, you know, besides Maslow's basic needs, one of their biggest needs is around identity. Decentralized identity that can travel with them wherever they go when they get asylum somewhere else so they're not dependent on these you know, old centralized passports. This is going to be a future around this new great reset. It gives us a huge opportunity to create a society that is <laughs> for the first time actually for, by, and off the people. <laughs> you know, the Constitution of the United States, and that is what democracy was supposed to be. And I want to be clear that in, in this conversation and in this great reset, I'm in Silicon Valley. I understand we all love ourselves a nice unicorn, right? We love the metrics of the nice unicorn. But in the great reset, these vanity metrics are going to be as important as a tweet from the current White House. Because remember, you can go back those 50 years. What made Silicon Valley great was not just the money or the weather or the memories of Steve. We celebrated failure and backed the audacity of creators to solve for the big problems. I would wager that the great reset or eviction is one of those big problems, you know, including those in the camps in Congo, not just to build yet another AI powered tokenized Snapchat filter platform. So to wind up, let me just say, we have no time to operate in status quo in our old comfortable patterns. I think that's, that's clear to all of us. The world hasn't just changed because you know change happens anyways we've all heard that it's the only constant but we've come to a reset we are in our final notice period and i personally could not be more optimistic about our path forward in this great reset i love this quote by carl jung who said people don't have ideas <laughs> ideas have people the great reset represents a generational opportunity for us it now just needs us, its people, to keep this gorgeous house we're renting from eviction. Can we please not fuck it up? Thank you. So I don't know how we're doing on time. I think we've got five minutes before, um, before we get to... Um, the next session and I don't know if there's any comments or questions that um, we want to go into. We have about 20 of us here. 
So if you have any quick questions you want to unmute and ask them, please go ahead. But thank you all for your time. Ah, I love all the comments, by the way. Hi, Amit. This is Lily. And, hi, Lily. Um, hi. Uh, I'm a friend of Michael's, and I really enjoyed your presentation. Um, so I have a question about decentralized ID. Um, you know, I think uh, if you think from a system perspective, uh, it's this, this, we're going through this deconstruct and reconstruct phase, right? And then, um, so we're going to like relate to each other in a different way. It's not the old label or old way of like a sourcing and, and you know, kind of matching each other, but it's all like a, it's almost like a dive into the social field and watch what's emerging in the social field. So how can um, decentralized ID help people to uh, better connect and also for maybe the system steward to better identify what is emerging. So one of the um, one of the traits of decentralized ID or decentralized anything is that you don't have a uh, a system steward, right? Like that, that's it, it's it it is going to be essentially decentralized. But I think one of the biggest benefits of decentralized ID. And we can go back to the example of the Norwegian Refugee Council and the, and the refugees. You know, for the most part, funding takes care of Maslow's basic needs. They have close to, NRC has close to 10 million refugees. Today, they're getting 5,000 refugees every day streaming in from Venezuela into our refugee camps in Colombia at the border. 5,000 a day. In the world of COVID, I, that's a different conversation. It is a nightmare because you now need to quarantine everyone because there are not, there's no tests. But there's not enough tests to test everyone. But they move from those camps so it, all along the way and they don't have passports. They don't have any form of ID. And the biggest challenge with that is that even if they had a passport, they need to burn it because they're in hiding, right? Most 73% of refugees are still running from oppressive regimes. So the decentralized ID allows them to, you know, have ID with verification at different points so that they can travel with them. But the beauty of things like zero knowledge proofs means that you can still make sure that I am who I am. You can make sure that I am above 18. You can make sure that I have this qualification or, or, or that degree without having to see all of my details. That's one of the huge advantages of, of decentralized ID. And it allows us, if you think of just thematically at Silicon Valley Blockchain Society, we think of health, wealth, future of work and, and impact. They are just not in isolation. Like if the one, one thing COVID taught us, there's going to be a huge impact on your wealth and no work until health is solved, right? And, and so until we can solve for those things, um, we're not going to have a future. And if we do it without decentralized ID, then we go into this massive surveillance state. And that's the big opportunity for us to do it. So I don't think it's, it's less connectedness. In fact, it's more connectedness. It's selective on what you get to see about me and I can give consent for you to see everything if you want it. Beautiful, thank you. You're most welcome. So I think we have Mark here who is taking over now. Um, hey Mark, how are you doing? Hi everybody, how are you? We did uh, we did pretty good on time. I, I apologize. We started a few minutes few minutes late. Uh, George, it was awesome to see your I think your your little girls who came in and said hi, huh? <laughs> That's cool, Stuart. Good to see you, man. Um, thank you all for the comments. And uh, I don't know if you already got my email address. I put it up in the. Um, in the little thank you. Uh, it's just Amit, my first name, A-M-I-T, at S-V-B-S dot one, Silicon Valley Blockchain Society, S-V-B-S dot one. Um, and if you want to get in touch, I'd, I'd love to connect. But uh, 